Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Well, I've only got a couple of announcements. Um, the first one was that uh, a couple of weeks ago I told you that I was going to be doing, recording two videos that would be important for you to hear about. One of them has now been edited and that is basically our vaccine and mask policy. And uh, we'll probably post that after the service. I've sent it to a couple of you that requested to be, have it be sent it early, but when it's not on a live stream and we're recording it, we do quite a bit of editing just to make it a little bit more high quality. And, uh, but just a review of what that says is that the elders feel we need to remain neutral in regards to that because we believe that they're a matter of individual convictions rather than universal ones. So you're not gonna be forced to wear a mask and you're not gonna be forced to va be vaccined at our church to attend, but also um, we're not going to judge anyone for their personal convictions around those things either. So you'll get a well biblically reasoned video that's posted on our YouTube page and also on our Facebook page that you can watch. Uh, one thing that might be helpful is actually building out your own perspectives and your own individual convictions regarding scripture. We go into 1 Corinthians 9 and Romans 14 where we talk about things that are not universal convictions but rather personal convictions. Second thing I want to do is um, I literally just sent uh, most of the men in our congregation, the ones that have cell phone, uh, for a invitation to an event in Springfield. It's called Be Bold. And it's a bonfire and burger kind of event where Wayne Cordero is going to be speaking. And we're going to be carpooling down there. Um, we'll meet, this is on the 18th, which is this is coming Saturday. And we're going to meet here in the parking lot. The event's at four. It takes about an hour and a half to get down to Springfield. So I thought we could meet in the parking lot at two o'clock. And I'll drive my spaceship down, which can fit 12 men. And uh, maybe we could find one other car to, uh, just depending on how many guys there are. Carpooling is uh, to, you know, Christian events that, you know, an hour and a half in the car. You can actually get to know people and uh, relate to one another. And oftentimes you come away with a friendship that you didn't have before that's deepened. So even if that would be the only reason, it'd be good. But I also think the event will be fantastic. So again, September 18th, 2 o'clock in the parking lot. If you're here, we'll drive together or carpool down to uh, Springfield and enjoy some burgers and some good teaching from Wayne Cordero. Uh, lastly, um, we have a live stream team, our AV team, audiovisual team, and we're building that out. And we have maybe five, at the most six people that are involved in that. And you may not consider yourself someone who's tech savvy, but there are aspects of that work that we need help with that you can easily be trained to do. One of the easiest ones would be the slides. So you're clicking through the slides, they're auto-populated and we just click through, you know, right before the next little verse comes up. And so we could use people who would be willing to do that. If you're actually interested in uh, learning how to uh, run a soundboard and you think you have some, uh, uh, some, some skill or talent in that area, we could train you to do that. As well as if you're interested in working on um, posting things to YouTube, learning how to live stream, things like that. We'll actually train you to do that and then you would just be signing up. One of the reasons why we want more people is because it's really important for us not to burn people out. And so the more people we have, the more enjoyable service at the live stream table is because less people uh, have, to, have to do it. And so we're looking for 10 total. We have maybe five. If you are interested in getting involved in that way, even in the, uh, the least difficult way of clicking through the slides, talk to Ben after the service. He'll be back at the live stream table and uh, you can just go talk to Ben, who's an elder at our church, but also in charge of that uh, ministry. So with that being said, that's... Uh, that's all the announcements for today. If you've got your Bible, go ahead and open it up to Luke 18. I'm particularly excited today because we're actually back in Luke in the verses. Last week was sort of a recap sermon of the Gospel of Luke. And if you open your Bible to chapter 18 of Luke, we're going through Luke 1 through 17. And I want to actually open us in prayer before we even approach God's Word. So if you bow your head with me. Heavenly Father, we come to your Word knowing that it is always true for everyone everywhere, that we have a need to even understand what it means and then another need to have the power to apply it in our lives. And because you've taught us that your Holy Spirit fulfills that need, we pray that your Holy Spirit would enable our minds and, and illuminate our minds to understand what your word is saying to us and how to apply that to our lives but also that your Holy Spirit would fill us with power to make this word actionable. We pray for transformation and change in our lives that I believe we all want and desire in this area. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I've got a couple questions for you, mainly just one. Um, you don't need to raise your hands here, but uh, have you ever wished that a friend would pursue you more? Maybe you really like this person. And you think, well, you pursue them and you get together with them for coffee, but it's kind of always you that's 
taking the initiative, and you wish they would reciprocate. Because sometimes maybe you get busy, and uh, they, they don't call you, they don't text you, they're not looking to set up times with you, and you wonder, well, do they, is it just me, or do they like me too? And conversely, do you have a friend that does pursue you? I have friends that pursue, you, pursue me, and if I don't text them for two weeks, they're sure to text in between, and like, hey, what's going on, you wanna hang out? They maintain the relationship, they put effort into maintaining the relationship, and I feel very comforted, encouraged, and strengthened by those kinds of relationships. But I have people in my life that I wish I was closer to, and where I feel like I'm missing out on their lives. A lot of my friends have young children. I feel like I'm missing out on who their children are and getting to hang out with them, um, partly because they're so busy, and don't really pursue back. And I can push it, but I don't feel like forcing myself into their schedule. That's not really how friendship works, feels awkward. And so do you have friends like that? Or do you have friendships like that? It's, uh, it's really only friendships that are mutual and reciprocating that you gain that kind of comfort and encouragement and strength from, uh, where they really help you in times of need. And then I thought about, well, I wonder if anybody thinks of that way about me. You know, I've got five kids. I don't know if you heard about this, but uh, my wife's pregnant, and so I'm about to have six. And um, regarding that, I just, I just think to myself, you know, I wonder if there are people in my life that just think I don't have space for them and that I'm not interested, but they pursue me. And I think I do. I think sometimes I'm the one that gets too busy to pursue or maybe just too lazy or self-absorbed or whatever it is. And then I began to think about, wow, I wonder if God feels that way about me. I wonder if God ever feels like I don't really reciprocate. Like he has pursued me like no one has ever pursued anyone. And then I'm just maybe a little bit apathetic in my relationship to him. And You know, one of the primary ways that we pursue the Lord is through prayer. If God was the person that you're considering the friend, do you think he thinks you're reciprocating? Do you pursue him back? Do you make effort to maintain the relationship with him through prayer, to communicate with him? Do you do it on a regular basis? We've all had seasons where we say, well, I'd I like to pray more. I'd like to be more disciplined in my prayer life. Man, I wish I was on fire like such and such person who prays on a regular basis. And it oftentimes becomes a task that we think we need to complete per day, an amount of time, and we need to say the right things. They need to be spiritually minded. We don't just want to ask for things. But I think we more rarely think about prayer in terms of pursuing a relationship with the Lord and deepening a relationship with the Lord. So think of that idea. Think about the friends that you have where it's just kind of sad that you don't have more interaction with them. Where you just feel, I wish we spent more time together. I wish I was more involved in their life. But there just isn't that reciprocity in relationship. And so it just hasn't been working out. And take that feeling. You know, I have friends whose children are now five years old and I've missed most of their children's lives. And it's sad. You don't get that back. Sad. I wish we were closer. I think they wish we were closer too, and just something's interrupting it. Well, take that sense of like lost opportunity and think about it in relationship to the Lord throughout this sermon, because there's going to be three qualities that are highlighted in this passage about what kind of prayer makes for a good relationship with the Lord. Three qualities. Normally, I give you my main point right up front. I want you to see this is like I was going to say the perfect three-point sermon. This, this is organized to be the perfect three-point sermon. <laughs> Whether it ends up being the perfect sermon depends on the delivery, I guess. But there's these three points that make up a main point, and that's what you're supposed to do as a preacher. You're supposed to show them three points. That's what almost every preaching teacher will teach. And you're going to find the first point about what makes a good relationship for God in terms of, in relationship to God in terms of prayer in chapter 18, 1 through 8. The second point in 9 through 14 and the third point in 15 through 17. I'm guessing at least one of these is going to be something that you want to see increased in your prayer life. But remember, don't think of this as a task to complete, but think about this as a relationship to pursue and deepen. Okay? So here, verse 1, Jesus says, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. Okay, so the point of this whole parable is that we would always pray and not lose heart that we would persevere in prayer, to just use one word, to persevere in prayer. And that's going to be your very first point of a uh, life of deepening relationship to the Lord. It's marked by persevering prayer, that you would not lose heart and pray. Now, how many of you, don't even raise your hands, but how many of you don't understand what that means? 
So even a single person in this room that doesn't understand the idea that we ought to just continue praying and not lose heart, not stop, not have whole seasons of dryness where we don't pray, you get that. So what's your need for a parable? Why do you need to hear a story about it? Well, go back to the friendship metaphor and think about the idea of maybe one of the reasons why you don't pursue a friend anymore or they don't pursue you is because there's something broken in the relationship. Or something happened. Maybe it's not something broken. Maybe they moved away and then moved just outside of that friendship zone where it takes just too long to get to them and it's just, you have to force it and it doesn't work anymore. They moved outside of your village. Some of us have bigger villages, some of us smaller, but you all know what it's like to lose a friend to a move. Or maybe it's the result of sort of, you've, you've been drifting apart in a lot of different ways and one of them is worldview. And so your worldview just kind of constantly clashes and you all of a sudden realize there's not enough similarity in thought to have a friendship because you're always arguing and there's, there's strife. Maybe that's it. Or maybe something happened. They did something that broke trust with you. They did something that hurt you. It's not the first time they've done it. It hasn't gotten resolved. Maybe you even did the faithful thing and went to them, like Matthew 18 says, and talked to them, and it just didn't work out. And now there's this brokenness in the relationship, and both of you are, are losing your interest in pursuing each other. Have you ever experienced that? Well, here's the interesting thing. That can happen with God, too. Most of us don't just wake up one day and it's like, eh, I don't want to pray anymore. I just randomly have lost my heart for prayer. It's something that happens in our relationship to the Lord that undermines our trust in him answering our prayer, in him even hearing our prayer, in him being interested in our needs. So consider, is there something, before we even go into this parable, is there something that's interrupted your prayer because your relationship with the Lord is interrupted? Maybe you asked him for something and he didn't give it to you, and maybe it was not trivial, it was really important. Well, that's the kind of thing that Jesus knows about, the kind of things that can just sort of cut off our blood supply to our heart that pumps our heart full of a desire to pray. And this was happening here, and it turns out that he has something to say about how to keep your heart in it when your heart is lost to prayer. So verse two, and he said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterwards he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down with her continual coming. So this widow has some kind of issue where she's been unjustly treated. I don't know if you've ever been unjustly treated to the point where it was maybe illegal or even criminal behavior or at least some kind of misdemeanor and you've gone to court about that. I know some of you actually have. I know that uh, that kind of thing has happened in my life. Have you ever been so mistreated that it was really a matter of justice. And in that moment, if you have, there's this desire in our hearts to see vindication, to see justice happen. And when it doesn't happen, it's, it's irresolvable because you know it was unjust how you're treated and there was no consequence for the person who did it. And it was really a serious thing. So injustice is unresolved are the kinds of thing that could interrupt your relationship with God. Maybe you've been calling out to God for, a, for justice in some kind of situation because you have an adversary. You have somebody that's really become, they were an enemy or they were a friend. They became a friend of me and now they're a real enemy to you. Maybe you've, you lost your job as a result of what they did or you lost your reputation and friendships because of what they posted about you online. And you just want things to be made right. You're not necessarily wanting an eye for an eye. You don't need God to hurt them back. It's not some kind of, you just want things to be made right right again and you're looking for justice and God has not given it to you and so you just like you lose your heart for prayer now this is not really with the stream of the sermon but I thought you know there's this little thing that really comforted me in this it's not so much about prayer but about something that Jesus knows it says here in a city in, in a certain this is Jesus telling the story in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man and I've, and I've been thinking about, you know, recently we have seen the laws that Texas has put in place to protect the destruction of unborn life. And then it was like two days later and some judge gets in the way of it. Like, hey, that's good, right, and true. Let me make, make, let me make sure that I'm going to just deny that justice. And it's discouraging when you see, I don't know if it's a majority or even half, but you see a lot of just judges doing the opposite of what is good, right, and true. And it can be discouraging to us. Like, what's going on? Things seem out of control in our nation, yet... Jesus knows, he's not unaware, 
that there are judges in any generation who neither fear God nor respect human beings. They don't care about what justice is, they don't care about you, and they just do whatever makes them look good to the world. They're self-interested. And so, although that's not really with the stream of what we're talking about, I thought, you know, it comforted me to know that God knows about the bad judges, you know, and they have what's coming to them unless they repent. And so you don't need to worry too much about the kind of wrong judgments that are being made in the world, God knows. But beside the point, back to this story, Jesus is illustrating the fact that when this widow calls for justice, although this judge is not a good guy, not a good dude, he doesn't care about justice, he doesn't care about her, he just cares about himself, and so she's nagging him to the point where he's like, this is bad enough for my life that I'll give her justice. I doubt he even cares or knows or agrees that what she needs is justice. He just finally gives her what she wants because she keeps coming. She has not lost heart that she might get justice over her adversary. And in verse 6, the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. You know, She's beating me down. So annoying. I'm going to finally give her justice. And now he compares that and contrasts that to God. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. So he's comparing the character of an unrighteous judge to the character of a righteous judge and God in this case, and he's saying even an unjust judge, if you just persevere in your pursuit of justice, will sometimes grant that, that justice. How much more a God who is righteous, who's the definition of justice, who cares more about this justice than you actually do, and how much quicker he's not going to delay, he's not going to wait. That is the character of God. And so sometimes the issue is we need to be reminded of God's character, which we actually believe is true. Sometimes our experiences tend to undermine our view of God's character. And so we need to be reminded of God's character and who he actually is. Otherwise, our prayer life can be interrupted. God loves us. He chose us before the foundation of the world, unconditionally. He chose because of his will. And he loves you. And he pursued you all the way to the point where he sent his son to die for your sin so that you could live forever in a forgiven way in a perfect relationship with the Lord. So he's not going to be delaying justice. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, I still haven't heard anything from him. It's been years, and I've been praying for years, and I still haven't lost heart, but still I haven't found that kind of justice. And I'm going to address that very issue with verses 15 and 16. What about when it hasn't happened speedily? What about when I still don't have... And maybe for you it's not justice. Maybe it's not that something was really wrong and needs to be made right Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's an unanswered prayer. I remember just this last uh, week on Wednesday in our Bible study, someone had said that someone lost their faith over an unanswered prayer, uh, and that prayer was unbelievably important to them, life and death kind of thing, and they'd lost their faith over that issue. And so we prayed for this person. Um, but I hear that happening all the time. I, get, I don't get tempted necessarily to walk away from the Lord. I have nothing else. If you know my story, it's just, you know, I was a man in rebellion against God, a man forgiven, and then a man in service of God. And I, I just can never go back. But I do get tempted. I still remember in my honeymoon, um, Christine got emergency room sick. The first thought I have is like, are you kidding me, God? Out of all the times that you could protect my wife, this is the one, you know? It's like ill to the point of emergency room. And there's this temptation to blame God for the circumstance. And when you start blaming God, He's not going to respond and be like, yeah, you're right, I was wrong. That's never going to happen, you know? So there isn't going to be some kind of reconciliation between the two when you've accused him. And you know that in your heart. But still, there's this sticking point. Like, why did that happen? And that needs a resolution. The resolution isn't found here in 1 through 8. But what we hear here in 1 through 8 is that God's character is good. It's righteous. It's true. He's not delaying justice because he's lazy or self-interested. He has a purpose for when he answers your prayer. And more often than not in my experience, when you pray and persevere, it's like overnight that all of a sudden this justice has happened. This prayer has been answered. We write our prayer requests down in the, in the Bible study. And then my wife actually, uh, you know, hand letters them into a little journal. And then sooner or later, enough have built up, enough have been answered. We read back. It's always the majority of the prayer requests that have been answered. Always the majority. We've been in these groups for well over a year now. We established them about a year and a half ago, I think. And uh, God answers so many more prayers than go unanswered. 
I think that will be your experience too if you don't lose heart in prayer. So are you persevering in your prayer life? If you're not, we want to help you. Ben is going to go ahead and put our website up in, in just a moment, and uh, we'll discuss one of the ways that we can help with your prayer life. If you're like me, you've made commitments before, oh, I'm going to pray more, and I'm going to start praying with my wife, or I'm going to start praying with my friends, or I'm going to pray alone, I'm going to set this time, and then you've done it for a while, and you kind of fall away from it. It's not that you lost your heart for prayer, it's that there's a lack of consistency, there's a lack of discipline, life gets in the way. Five kids get in the way, and so you start thinking, well, I'm just so busy. And when we have five kids, you need to be praying all the more for them, not less. And so you start feeling guilty, like, I just want to be praying more. I want to be more devoted in my prayer life. Well, one of the things that I have found is that my own sense of discipline and my own conviction to pray all by myself is far weaker than when I commit to pray with other people. And so we want to build structures for you that you can just commit to, hey, at this time of this day, I'm going to be there. I'm going to just pray with my friends at church. And when you have that kind of a commitment, it's just like working out. When you work out alone, oh, I don't feel good today, I'm going to skip it. But when you have a partner who feels great, it's like, don't skip it. You're, you know, you're, you committed to this, let's go. And then you go and work out anyway, and it ends up being a good day. It's similar with prayer. It helps to be praying in community. So this is just uh, our website. So you just go to our website and then click on prayer. It's one of the top tabs. We're trying to make it as easy as possible. It's um, literally two clicks to get into a prayer room in Zoom. And then you can either click join with Zoom or join with your phone. I'm not gonna read that whole paragraph, but basically at seven to eight, every single Wednesday, unless it's announced on the website, you'll see a little banner, no prayer today. There are times when, when that happens. I mean, during the ice storm or the smoke, those are the kinds of things that we would sometimes cancel prayer for. You're gonna see me, you're gonna see Vern, and you're gonna see a couple other um, guys and gals. They're really regularly praying. And you can just join us in person if you'd like. We pray right here in the prayer room. The door at the front will be open 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. every single Wednesday. Now you might say to yourself, oh man, I want to join that, but I've got a standing work meeting that I can't get out of. Oh man, I want to join that, but that's earlier than I can with kids or whatever. You have some legitimate reason for not being able to make it there. We're in the process, process of developing more prayer hours like this. I would actually like to hear from you um, about that. For example, we're just trying to put in prayer hours that make it convenient for you. So maybe the very next one would be like a Friday at noon. Maybe uh, some of you have, have time on Friday at noon. The morning just doesn't work. Or another one could be in the evening on Monday nights. And we're going to have leaders who are well-trained, who know how to lead us in prayer. One of the things that will happen in an in a hour meeting is you'll get together and you kind of small talk. And next thing you know, you've been talking for half an hour and there's barely any time for prayer left. Most of the time, we're praying for like 40 minutes or so. so. We actually pray most of the time. Now, we realize your lives are, lives are busy. Some of you live well outside of town. Actually coming in person is, is a major commitment. Now, I think if you make that commitment in any one of these prayer hours that we develop, uh, God will bless that. God likes seeing you sacrifice in relationship to him. How loved do you feel when someone uh, is like, you know what, I'm busy, but you're too important for me to just allow the relationship to fizzle. You feel really loved. And uh, so God sees our sacrificial love in the sense of us sacrificing things to be able to come and pray. And I've often experienced how that adds a degree of, of power to our prayer lives. But do you think God's not listening just because you zoom in? No, he's listening. Do you think your prayer doesn't count because you zoom in? No. So we're trying to make it as easy as we possibly can for you to join us for one of these hours of prayer. And we're going to be as flexible as we can. If you join us at 7.13, 7.27, if you wake up way late and don't join us till 8.45, no shame, no guilt, we're just going to say, hey, so-and-so, join us in prayer, and you'll join us in prayer at the end. If you come right at the beginning, you'll hear the prayer request, and you'll have more of a sense of continuity. But I'll literally interrupt prayer for you joining online, say hi to you, and fold you into the prayer. And the leaders will be trained to do that too. Not only that, I know that many of you got sick zooming in constantly, never getting me to face-to-face, and we understand that. But we've done quite a bit of work to have a state-of-the-art zoom, uh, state uh, zoom conference room. So we have a thing called an owl. It's, it's a little camera that sits in the middle and also a, a microphone that sits in the middle. Audio quality is good. Visual quality is good. But what it actually does is It'll zoom in on the person that's talking. In a smaller room, it works much better than you've experienced it in the large room downstairs on our Wednesday Bible study. But what that does is instead of you just seeing a camera wide shot of all the people sitting there, you will be coming and on a TV. You can actually walk in the prayer room after church and see that. It's still in progress under construction. 
but we're nearly finished with it. And if you zoom in from home, it's an experience that's much better than your normal Zoom experience. So you're right there with us, you're actually seeing the person talking. We try to make it the most engaging experience that you can. In other words, once we have two or three prayer hours, there's gonna be multiple ways that you can connect in praying with other people. Not only that, we're gonna go ahead and take verse seven, like as hyper literally as we can. More literally than you even need to take it. I think when uh, it talks about, and will God not give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night, that doesn't mean that they were praying all the way through the night, but it means that they were praying to him more than once a day, in the, in the day during the day, and even at night, they're crying out for justice. We're going to go ahead and take it even liter more literally than that, and we're going to pray for 24 hours straight as a church. Okay, We're planning that for November 5th and 6th. I'm going to double check and make sure that I got the dates right here. That is a Friday and a Saturday in November. should be the first Friday and Saturday in November. And we will start right at 5 o'clock. I'm sure there are people that can get off work earlier or maybe don't even uh, currently work that can just start at 5 and you might think, wow, all of us are going to pray for 24 hours. No, we're going to have a sign-up that I'll, uh, we'll have an electronic sign-up. We're looking at using our planning center um, to be able to have you sign up. So we'll walk you through that next Sunday, how you can sign up. And you can sign up for a half an hour segment, an hour segment. You don't even have to come in person. You want to wake up, three, wake up at 3 a.m. and join who's ever praying in person. We're hoping to have at least two people in person at all times. You can just join from home, pray for half an hour, go right back to sleep. The point is we're going to have a round-the-clock prayer in the prayer room starting at 5 o'clock on November 5th, going all the way through 5 o'clock at Saturday, uh, the 6th, and then we're going to have a meal together and anybody can come. And uh, there's no way for you to eat via Zoom. So we haven't figured that one out yet. You're going to have to come in person if you want to be part of the meal. Okay, so all you need to do right now if you're interested in enjoying our 24-hour prayer, and I think you should be, I think you should, it would be amazing to see a lot of participation on this, um, is just write down, block off the 5th and 6th. Hopefully you don't already have something that day. If you do, we understand. But again, the 5th and 6th. So we're working as a church to put in structures and times and events, regular and periodic, to help you not just jumpstart your prayer, but start making it a regular rhythm. Not only that, we already have some regular rhythms for the whole congregation. If you come on Wednesday nights at 6 and join our small group, we call them discipleship communities because we eat together, we study God's word together, and we pray together every single Wednesday. So there's, and that's Wednesday evening. So we, I guess we already have two times where we pray together as a church and anyone can be part of that. But um, at the end of the day, there really is no substitute for you praying all by yourself, oftentimes called private prayer. But what will happen is if you start committing to live in a rhythm of prayer is that will spill over and you'll begin to pray for the people that ask you to pray for them in person. I, multiple times, you know, Vern will mention, hey, this and this person is sick and I need to pray for them. And so I didn't pray for them just on Wednesday, but on Friday, God prompts me again. And again, I'm praying for this person. So prayer begets prayer and a lack of prayer begets a lack of prayer. And we're doing what we can to help you build persevering prayer into your life. I would say the most motivating thing for me in terms of persevering prayer is a deepening relationship to the Lord. Not just a relationship where you learn about him from scripture, but where you actually interact with him. You start seeing him answer in a signature way to you, prayers like you know it was him. You know it was him, you just asked about that. And then he gave it to you and you're like, wow. It just deepens your connection and, and there's nothing better than being close to the Lord. And there's nothing other than studying God's word and praying really guarantees a deepening relationship with the Lord. So, persevering prayer. Are you persevering? Are any one of these kinds of structured ways of approaching it, would they be helpful for you? Could you commit to them? Could you join us even this Wednesday on Zoom or in person? You're welcome. We're doing everything we can to help you with that. And uh, that is going to be the first mark of a life of a good relationship with the Lord in terms of prayer, is persevering prayer. But there's more to it. Starting in verse 9 through 14, and he tells them another parable. He also told them this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, idolaters, and even like this tax collector. He chose a lot of really bad people to compare himself to, didn't he? You know? We do that. We choose people that are way below us in our perception to make ourselves feel better. And he did the same thing. Verse 12, I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, a tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. 
But he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, the tax collector, rather than the other, the Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So what quality of prayer is Jesus actually looking for? Does he want persevering prayer that makes you feel like you're really special and good and better than other people? No. He wants persevering prayer that's also humble. And this happens to us. We'll persevere in prayer and we start feeling like we're, like we're better than we actually are because we finally actually kept our prayer commitment and it becomes this kind of checkbox check spirituality. You checked off prayer for the day. Uh, how would you feel if someone checked you off as having maintained the relationship with you that day just because they texted you or called you? And you knew that that's kind of what they were doing, just making sure you don't think that they're not pursuing you. Check, did my little friendship thing today. That's not how it works. That's not how a relationship works. That's not how you deepen a relationship. You pursue something because you want to be around them, because you desire to be close to them. And while you might not be able to tell that someone is just kind of a little checkbox friends with you, God always knows whether you're coming to him like the Pharisee or the tax collector. And the biggest difference is that the ter- Pharisee thought it was his goodness that gets him close to God. And the tax collector believed it was God's grace. It's not your goodness that deepens your relationship to the Lord. It's God's grace. It's not mostly God's grace and a little bit of your goodness. It's only, always, just, exclusively God's grace and none of your goodness. In fact, your goodness is an illusion. Do you know that biblically? We don't have any goodness that gets us closer to God. We don't have any goodness that gets closer to God. And it's so good that God has revealed that to us because if he hadn't, we would all just make our own arbitrary standard up. You know, even murderers will look at, well, at least I'm not a pedophile, right? Everybody has someone they can look down on. Everybody has a different standard of what's good enough. You could never actually know that you're saved if it was a standard that fluctuates. You would never be certain. God says there's no, you can never reach the standard of perfection. You can't. You've done even one thing wrong, you can't reach that. And so it's always just my grace. You know, there are versions of Christianity where it's, it's almost that, but like God's grace comes down and it's like 11 feet above the ground, but you still need to jump and get to it. There's some little part of that that you have to make up. And you know what? It's your prayer life. You need to pray more. You need to give more. You need to fast more. You need to be better than these murderers out there. And there's just nothing we can do to make it up. It's actually the opposite. God says all of our good works are like filthy rags before him. They stack up to worthlessness, to waste. And one of the reasons that is, it's not that you're incapable of doing something good. It is that you do something good and it's stacking up towards like almost getting to God. This is always something that glorifies you. It's always something that makes you look good. And it leads towards contempt for others who are not living according to your standard. You see that in the Pharisee's life. So it would not be worth persevering in prayer if you're pridefully persevering, would it? So it has to be not just perseverance, but it has to be humble perseverance. It turns out that without the humility that says, I need your mercy, Lord, because I'm a sinner, you're not even justified before God. What does justified mean? It's one of the more complicated theological terms. Paul has written an entire book of Romans. You know, I don't know if you knew this, but... Um, There have been more books written about Romans that are like near a bestseller list than like any other books. Like the Romans book alone has more books written about it than you can even imagine. And it's because what Paul explains there is that we're justified by faith alone through grace alone. It's not that complicated of a concept if you get it. It means that you believe in God to have made a way for you to be forgiven through the cross So it's faith alone, none of your works, none of them add up to that. So you just believe, you just trust. And faith points away from yourself, it doesn't point towards you. It points, by definition, away from yourself towards God. And so you believe in him and you believe in him that he's made a way for you to be declared righteous even though you had no way to accomplish it yourself. By faith alone, through grace alone. And then they add in Christ alone, just to make really clear that it's, it's through Jesus that we have that grace. And it's in the God who... He is the son of, and the perfect representation of, and the very image of, and in himself, God, that we're talking about. It's not some other God. God left us with the most specific definition of who he is. 
You say Jesus is God? Okay, you're worshiping God the Father. You say Jesus isn't God? You get the Jesus wrong? You make him something different? You're not worshiping God the Father. So it's by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. And you know, it's interesting. You hear stories about people sitting in the pews who everyone else in the church thinks are Christians who one day all of a sudden understand this. God reveals it to them. Maybe they humble themselves and they just realize, wow, I can't be good enough. It clicks in their mind and they realize that they've never actually really been a Christian before and become a Christian that day. So you might think, you know, I've heard this so many times, but it's, it's worth repeating over and over and over again. Because even if you believe it and you've lived your life about it, we wake up with this fleshly desire to still climb our way, even if we can only make it up to the counter, still just to climb our way. I just want to be a little bit worthy. And it's such a, such a deadly pursuit. It'll kill your relationships. It'll dampen your relationship to the Lord. The closest people to the Lord are the ones who are most desperate for his grace. So I want you to consider that. When you pray, is there a part of you that's desperate for his mercy? If you're not desperate for his mercy, it means you're not self-aware enough about your sin. So what should you do? Just become more self-aware? Well, I don't think you can just reveal to yourself how sinful your sin is. I think you also ought to pray and ask God, hey, will you show me where I need your grace? And not just to wash, rinse, and repeat, but to be transformed and stop living that way. Will you show me? So prayer is also the answer to growing in humility. It's kind of a vicious circle, though. You're prideful. You become more and more unaware of your own sin. You think less and less that you need God's mercy. You think lower and lower of other people and higher and higher of yourself. Versus the opposite, good circle, that you realize, wow, I need God so much every day. I constantly make mistakes. Without him, I wouldn't even be in relationship to him. Without him, I wouldn't even be able to breathe and move and have my being. And so you come to prayer, not just asking him for things, but also with a sense of dire need for grace. So those are the first two qualities of a good relationship to the Lord in terms of prayer. The two qualities of prayer are perseverance and humility. Not just any kind of humility, like humility, I'm not a good person, I need God's grace. He knows. Nobody else knows like he knows. So you can't fake it with him. But there's one more quality, and this is the quality that really resolves that issue, that can resolve that issue of like, well, he didn't answer my prayer. And this is verse 15 through 17. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. They didn't want him having to mess with infants. And we get like that sometimes. We think of children's church as something that we have to do. It's like, oh, I got asked, and I have to go down there and babysit. That's not Jesus' attitude about children. He loves them. It is a privilege to teach them. It's more effective statistically to teach children, 1 through 13, than any other demographic. In fact, I might get this statistic off by a couple of percentage points, but it's in the 90s of children learn 90%, I think it might even be 95% of what they're going to believe about God for the rest of their life from the age of 1 to 13. It's that high. I wish I had the statistics to back it up, but I, I remember researching this in the past. So the most effective time to ever teach children about God, uh, teach people about God is when they're children. So it's a high honor and a privilege to teach them. It's unbelievably effective. It just doesn't offer a whole lot of public rewards, does it? You know, because children don't all of a sudden say at seven years old, hey, thank you so much for teaching me God's word. They might not even come back in their 30s, although they think it. Sooner or later, they'll, they'll remember who taught them God's word and they'll be thankful. But Jesus called them to him saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Now it's easy to miss the idea of prayer in here because Jesus is there in person and so they're bringing their infants to Jesus in person. But the motivation for that is no different than the motivation for prayer. Your child is sick, you're going to pray on your knees to God. If Jesus is here in person, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get to him, but it's the same thing. We're asking God himself for help with our children. And Jesus turns it around and actually says, not only don't push them away, it's your pride that's pushing them away. You need to be like one of these children just to be um, entering the kingdom of God. And so we need to think about what are the qualities of children that he wants us to act. Does he want you to be childish? Childish? Want you to throw temper tantrums? You ever throw a temper tantrum as an adult? It's so embarrassing when you realize that's what you've been doing. You're usually hungry, 
angry, lonely, tired. I think someone said, halt. You know, don't throw the temper tantrum. It happens to us so easily, though. But children, it's just, it just comes out like, I'll say no to one of my children, and immediately their face is screwing up, and they're not great actors, and still tears are coming down their eyes. For them, it's very real. The emotion is very real. Imagine if you act like that as adults. It'd be very strange to be around someone that you'd say no to, and they just immediately start squealing and bawling as an adult. Yeah, maturing baby is not a good thing. But that's not one of the qualities he's highlighting. More than ever, as a father of five young children, soon to be six, I've started to understand the kind of quality that Jesus is talking about here. And let me explain it to you. Isaiah is already starting to transition out of that. He's intelligent. He sees, you know, the discrepancies in what I say and what I do. He's starting to see I'm not perfect. And so he's starting to come out of that, that early childhood range. But the question of whether my children trust me, trust me, is never even minorly interrupted by me saying no to them. They might be upset that I said no to them, but they don't all of a sudden think, well, now I don't trust you anymore. They don't. They don't have that, they don't have that kind of framework. Children have a sense. They're not innocent, according to God's word. We're born sinners. We're born with a sinful nature. And so it's wrong to think biblically that children are innocent, but there's a sense in, people like to say there's an innocence there, there's a lack of jadedness. They don't have enough time in a relationship to people who realize people will lie to you, they will cheat you, they will steal from you, and so you gotta kind of protect yourself. Children have a sense of a little bit of a blank slate in relational history, and they don't think like, I'm just gonna stop trusting you now because you said no. In fact, my children trust me so much, I have an unbroken record of throwing them up in the air and catching them. I've never dropped one. So we have this uh, outdoor awning, like rain uh, uh, roof kind of thing, and they'll hit their uh, badminton, what's it called, a shuttlecock or the birdie or whatever it is, they'll hit it up there, and then we have them all up there and we have to get up there. I'm too heavy to get up there, it's the corrugated kind of thing, I would just fall right through, and a ladder won't get it there unless I'm like with a broom, and so oftentimes what I'll do is I'll put one of the kids on the roof, and their army calling across, getting it, and then, um, I, I looked at one of them and said, jump down, thinking they're going to say, no, daddy, let me like slide down, hang down, and then you grab me. Immediately, Elijah jumps. Boom, right away. He's the guy that I put up there. I almost didn't catch him because it was mostly just a joke. I didn't think he was going to actually jump. Without even questioning, he jumped. Never dropped him. Didn't drop him that time. Immediately, Isaiah says, I want to do it. So I put him up there, and, and he jumps. Same thing with Ezra. This is when I just had Isaiah. Well, when Judah's too young. As that case, Judah's my, my fourth boy. And so there's this unbroken trust with them that does not get undermined when I say, no, you can't have this candy. No, you can't have video games right now. No, you can't go outside. No, you can't do this. And as we become an adult, though, sooner or later, when God says no to us, it begins to undermine our trust. Like, is he really good? Why did he say no? It's because there's this pride that's coming. It's no longer a childlike faith. It's just trusting him. And you say, well, I'm not a child anymore. But in terms of your relationship to God, it doesn't diminish you at all to think of yourself as a young child in relationship to him. He's God. He's infinitely more mature and intelligent than I am compared to my children, to compared to us. So we ought to think of ourselves in that kind of way, in terms of trust. It's the, it's the virtue I want to highlight. Do you trust the Lord? Has something in your life undermined your trust towards him? He said no. And you're like, well, you said you were good. You said you would heal me. I have this disease. You said no. How could you be good? Or maybe you are good, but you're not in control, and you start doubting his sovereignty. And by the way, it's not just your flesh that does that. The enemy wants to drive a wedge between you and the Lord. And one thing that he constantly challenges is, you know, you know God is in, all, in control, and you know he's good. So God or Satan wants to separate those two. He wants to say, you can't logically believe that. He's either good and not in control, or he's fully in control and not good. Look at all the bad things that happen in the world. If he was in control, it wouldn't be happening. So you have to think about that. You know, we, we end up being proven wrong, though, when we start thinking like that. I had a friend who, when we'd read through the Old Testament together, would always have a sticking point in the places where God judges nations. Like, he'll destroy a whole nation. We don't have time to talk about that. It's a tough thing for people to believe. But ultimately, he thought, well, that can't be good. That can't be good. So either that's not who God is, and the authors of this book got it wrong, or it is, and he just kind of puts it to the side and doesn't know what to do with it, but never really believes it. It's important when you go through those passages that you don't start thinking God's not just. When he judges, he's always right to, and when we judge that, all that means is that we don't take sin seriously enough. We don't take it as seriously as God does. 
But then on the flip side, this same guy, and we do this all the time as Christians, a missionary couple that he was supporting, um, I think they were missionary couples to like a, a tribe. I can't remember whether it was in the Amazon, but it was in a place where there was a, was a tribe and they got killed. And they were the best people he knew, the best people he knew. And he loved them and he supported them. And now it was unjust for God to not have saved them. So one time God acts in justice and judgment and another time he doesn't. Well, in this case, if God had just destroyed that tribe from killing the missionaries, she had greater purposes than that. If he just destroyed that tribe from killing the missionaries, maybe my friend, who was friends with the missionaries, would have thought that was just. But another person was like, what were you doing? Just wiping out a whole group of people? You can see how we just, we'll judge God if he does justice, and we'll judge God if he doesn't do justice. And it's always only us that defines that justice. Children don't work like that. Children don't work like that. They have, you know, it's almost like they wake up in the morning and they're just like reprogrammed to trust mommy and daddy. You have to do a lot of continually wrong stuff to abuse their trust as young children. And they, you see them growing out of it as they get older. So what has interrupted your trust in the Lord? Has he not answered a prayer? Something happened in your life, he answered it differently than you wanted him to? Would you be willing to return to that childlike trust? You're not contradicting that he's good. You're not willing to say he's not in control. It's your flesh and the enemy that have tried to separate those two things. So you can actually make commitment. You can ask for forgiveness. God, forgive me for not trusting your character, that you're a good judge and that you will give justice speedily, that you'll answer my prayers, that I cry out to you day and night and I don't need to lose heart. God, humble me. Show me how much I'm in need of your grace. Fill my prayers with that kind of humility. And Lord, return me to the trust I had in the beginning of my faith. Almost everyone, when they first come to faith, they just trust God like a child. Do you want that back? Those are the qualities that lead to a good relationship to, uh, towards God in terms of prayer. And so a good relationship to God is marked by persevering, humble, and trusting prayer. Now, if something else is not resolved that I didn't mention, I'll tell you from my experience, but also from my understanding biblically, the number one thing, and really the only thing that always resolves any issue I have with God is the cross. If you're recognizing, wow, I've lost my heart for prayer. I see some pride in my life. I'm getting kind of judgy about these people over here. And man, I don't act like a child at all anymore. I'm jaded and don't trust. And you're in that place and that's what interrupted your prayer. You think back what God had to do for you just to establish the relationship in the, per in the first place. He had one, well, two perfect relationships to two other persons of the Trinity for all eternity. Is a relationship to his son and the power of the Holy Spirit. There was no interruption. He didn't need relationship to us. He creates us. He gives us freedom to make choices. We choose the exact opposite of his will. We sin. We fall from grace. We devolve into a world that is so evil that he actually has to judge us by just kind of drowning the whole world. It wasn't Noah's righteousness like the movie that caused him to be saved. It was his faith that God used to declare him righteous and that's why he was saved. So it was still disgrace alone, faith alone, but Christ alone in the Old Testament as well. And so then you watch God make a people for himself and he saves them out of Egypt and he brings them into a promised land that they weren't even willing to take by faith, but he's patient. After 40 years, they go and return, get another chance to go in the promised land. They go in the promised land and immediately they start capitulating to the evil practices of those people groups. And immediately they say, no, we don't want to do it like you wanted with judges. We want a king like the other nations. They get a king and the first king is actually a guy who obeys, disobeys the two main commandments that he was given. Don't make sacrifices without Samuel there and go ahead, in this case, destroy this entire evil nation. He doesn't. He doesn't do what God says and so he gets the throne. And the second king, greatest king of all Israel, is David. Was everything about David good? No, he ended up being a murderer and adulterer, but he was a man after God's own heart and repented. But after David, things start declining. There was this great time where Solomon uh, and his wisdom just reigned in all of Israel. But then he you know, went after foreign gods, partly through the temptation of all the marriages that he took, which God said, don't do it, don't get married to foreign wives. And after that, it's like every other king with only every once in a while little blip does only always more evil in the eyes of the Lord, even more evil than his father before him. And they get these terrible report cards. So you watch over and over again, no matter how much grace, no matter how much privilege, no matter how much goodness, no matter how how much God does for them, they just constantly go the opposite of the right way. 
The God who raised them from, uh, saved them from slavery in Egypt is no longer good enough, and so they choose a God like Molech who says, kill your children for me in the fire. Right? They don't choose a semi-decent God against God. They choose the most evil God against God, and this is the pattern of God's people. And then Paul, fast forward into Romans, says, look, I see what's good and what's right and what I should do. But I keep doing the exact opposite of what I want to do. And he feels like this wretched man who sees what's good but doesn't have the power to do it. And then he explains that it's actually by the power of this indwelling spirit that we can put to death the misdeeds of the body. And one of those misdeeds is prayerlessness. And so if you're in that place, what you need is to come to communion today. You need God's grace and you need his forgiveness for having allowed yourself to distrust him for allowing yourself to get prideful, to allow yourself to lose your heart for prayer, you need his strengthening grace to return to you that. And so as uh, Joy and Daniel come up and begin to lead us in worship, I'm gonna go ahead and pray for us that this would not be just one more sermon about prayer that convicts you, yeah, I should pray, but this would be a sermon that ignites our heart for prayer and pursuing the Lord relationally through it. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would speed the work that we're doing to make it easier for people to connect in prayer to you in a way that's in community, in a way that helps us to be disciplined, but that doesn't feel like just checking it off, but rather an exciting ministry where we look forward to praying together, look forward to your answers to those prayers, and look forward to a deepening relationship to you. I pray that during communion, Lord, you would convict those who need conviction, challenge those who need challenge, Comfort and console and encourage those who need that. But I pray that not one person in this church would leave unchanged in terms of the relationship to you through prayer. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.